So really before, um, I'm so delighted to have David here. I've known him for many, many years. Um, he fits right into our themes and our objectives, and it's great to have some collaboration with him in, in any way we can, um, um, considering all of our, our focus on well the world and both our profession risk and, and financial professionals about behaviors, decision making, why people behave the way they do and make decisions the way they do given the environment. Um, that they're in. And um, and David and I both spoke at a conference. Um, I was actually there in person in London, and I think, I can't remember, David's flight was cancelled or something, so he was tuning in on the big screen. Um, uh, it, it, it was, I think it was, I mean, it was the Saga City Conference on Risk Intelligence and Decision Making. So it, it was very interesting. And um, I hadn't seen David's, this presentation. I know I, I've, He's been talking about, I mean, he is the guru of positive risk taking. There's no doubt about it with his books and something he's been discussing for a long time before it became a popular topic. Um, but this was a really authentic presentation that I thought both forums will really enjoy and will, will like to apply um, to their work. Um, and of course, David um, has helped me before with the rethinking risk. Um, we did a, a podcast and um and he's inter always introducing me to people and new books um, from his peers as well. So um, without further ado, David, I want to pass the mic over. And as always, everyone, please raise your hand as we go. If you have questions as he goes through his slides, I'll be looking for. And then please share your thoughts. And of course, at the end, we'll we'll round out um, with a summary from Steve, our chair of the Global Forum. So welcome, David and Keith. Rachel, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate the invitation to join you. And as Rachel had mentioned, we've known each other in this. Rachel, I hope I don't offend you by saying this for decades. Oh, yes. um, and we've also made the connection that my father grew up in the same town that Rachel grew up in and my grandfather built or supervised the building of a number of the bridges in that town, which I hope by now have been repaired or replaced, Rachel. <laughs> um, but but these, these connections um, throughout what is a growing profession you know, Rachel and I go back to the days when the idea of a chief risk officer was pretty novel, and I'll talk a little bit about that, I think, during the presentation. Um, but this is such an important initiative. These initiatives um, are so important. I'm always happy to support Rachel and what she's doing. Um, a real quick bit about me, and then I want to talk to you just a bit about our organization and how it relates to what you guys are, are doing. So I really have well, I suppose I have multiple careers, but the first half was actively managing risk. So I ran risk programs for three different companies. And while I was running one of them, um, an organization that I was a volunteer for in the risk space had a governance scandal. And out of that governance scandal, a new organization was born, which you may know, Premia, that Rachel had mentioned. And so I wound up running Premia for its first five, six years, which set me down a path of looking at how globally we can share best practices, share information, develop um, concepts, uh, and bring them from all parts of the world together to make them better. So that was a great experience. And when I finished that um, in 2007, handed it over to the people who I had hired, the first thing I did was a study with a gentleman at Columbia Business School asking whether boards understood risk. As you know, what came in the financial crisis that followed, the answer we got then was no, they didn't. And what we did early in 2008 as a result of that survey was form something called the DCRO. D stands for director, CRO obviously stands for chief risk officer. And the goal of this group was to help connect boards with the risk infrastructure at their organizations and understand risk better. And at the same time to help people who are in these new CRO roles understand the needs of board members. So this group wound up having about one third chief risk officers, one third board members, one third other C-level executives in about 120 countries. It was an ad hoc group, but we focused on sharing best practices, as I just mentioned before, developing some guiding principles documents and developing something we call a qualified risk director um, designation, which is the equivalent of a financial expert uh, on an audit committee. So that group was very deeply committed to advancing the way in which boards understand risk. As I'd mentioned, when we started back in 2008, there were probably two or 300 chief risk officers in the world. Today, if you go to LinkedIn and do a search for that, you're gonna find there are about 23,000 people who have that chief risk officer title. It's an amazing growth in the profession. 
in part because we've been able to demonstrate the value of it. And I think that's that's essential for anything that, that we're doing. When we got to the pandemic, though, everybody was talking about boards and risk. So I went out to our group and I said, is there any reason for us to exist anymore? This was ad hoc. It was nothing, nothing formal. And the answer that came back was that we need to focus on a couple of things. We need to focus on education to help people understand risk in a way that, as Rachel had said, we embrace it in a positive fashion towards achieving our goals. Related to that, the second thing that came back was we can't let the narrative around risk be dominated by loss and control. It's pretty easy in an environment like a pandemic to go focus on that. We'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation today. But we want to make sure that risk gets back to this place of understanding its role in the, ne the necessary activities of an organization and how we use risk well. And the third thing was to more formalize this qualified risk director designation. So that's something that uh, we now have qualified risk directors, I think, serving on boards in about 20 countries. We have people enrolled in our programs from about 90 countries. And I think when Rachel and I have talked about this global forum for risk uh, governance, risk and performance, as well as the CRO forum, what we see is that the role that the accounting profession can play and the role that the risk people can play will have a dramatic impact on the future of risk management. And, and I say that very specifically because of an article I wrote with David Martin, um, who'd been the head of risk for Citigroup, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, where we talked about this movement towards risk becoming a line item or risk being something that's quantified and becomes a normal input into business decision making. So I think your group's going to have a, a huge influence on that. So with that, Rachel, um, I'm going to try and share my screen here and then I'll get started with the presentation and I'll do a quick check with you to make sure that the share is working. And let me know if we're OK. It looks yeah. great. OK, and, good. And everyone, I'll be sending, I'll be emailing the um, slides, David's slides as well in the follow up email. Yeah, and I'm happy to um, when I'm done with this or at any point, uh, you know, Rachel can share either a calendar link to me or or my email. I'm happy to speak to anyone further about this stuff. So a lot of what we're talking about today is conceptual, but I always think conceptual ideas have to be there at the foundation for any decision that you're making and any path you're taking yourself down. If you don't know what the values are, if you don't know what the concepts are and the philosophy is, you're just really meandering and reacting. So, so this is really um, as much philosophy today as it is practice, but I think you'll see where it connects back to the practice. So we hear a lot about uncertainty and how challenging, quote, these times are. Yet despite this radical uncertainty about the future, Organizations and individuals still must take risks to thrive and let alone survive. We will never know what the future holds, and that's an important concept. It's probabilistic. Until it's observed, we only have our assessment of what it might look like on which to base our decisions. So these probabilistic assessments are not just point estimate probabilities, although you'll see that in some risk reports. They're distribution assessments, and they may not be very good, or they may be tricking us into bad decision making because our risk perceptions about those distributions are distorted. So now before you go thinking, I believe every person is conducting a mathematical exercise with every decision that they make. I will assert that your brain is trying to do just that, but it's using shortcuts. It's making emotional assessments and using heuristics to assess these probabilities. How much those emotions and heuristics indicate you should trust that assessment goes a long way towards deciding what you will do. For example, you made the assessment to join the session today, and now you might be asking yourself, do I really wanna sit here and listen to this for 45 minutes? Or do I have something else I'd rather be doing, something I find more valuable? What I'm gonna be talking to you today is about how complex the decision-making process is when one considers dependencies on others. And almost all of us have inescapable dependencies on others. For example, who checked the engine on the last flight you took or the brakes on the last train you boarded? Do you know them? Do you trust them? When did they do it last? Did you even think about that? Or did you trust the system that provided those vehicles to you to be safe? Three years ago, you probably trusted the supply chain that brought you much of what you used and rarely gave it any consideration because it worked so well. Very rarely did the supply chain ever disappoint you, and as a result, became almost invisible. 
until suddenly supply chains were anything but invisible. My focus today is on how boards of directors and senior executives make decisions in highly turbulent times where multiple critical elements that have been relatively trustworthy are all in motion. Think climate, geopolitics, economic conditions, health conditions, migration, technological changes, generational changes in attitudes, changing behavioral expectations, political whiplash. All of you in the UK know about that in the US too, all of which intersect with each other in often amplifying ways. So my goals today are four. One, to help you understand that our organizations are complex systems. You'll hear me emphasize that word over and over again. And they have high dependencies on other systems. I want you to recognize that these dependencies on others are almost inescapable. I want you to see that board decisions are more likely to create value when we incorporate the knowledge from these dependencies and come to know trust as the central element to value creating decision making and a role that accounting and risk management can play in that. So in my conversations with board members around the world, I often ask what the dominant concern is today, and nearly all include some kind of reference to the murkiness of the future with, quote, so much in motion. It is difficult to see through the fog, the clouds, the mud, but boards must see forward. It's one of their fundamental tasks. And the state of affairs creates fear, even if few board members would ever admit to being afraid. To understand why this matters, we have to step back and look at a few critical building blocks to the story I'm going to tell. We're going to look at how we determine the value of something, how our brains determine the value of something, and the most important part of that quote equation that is often ignored, even though it's the most important part. We're going to talk briefly about how value is created, how our brains work, at least what I've learned from some neuroscientists and psychologists, the impact of risk perceptions, complex systems, freedom, liberty, the importance of stakeholders, and a concept I've developed, which Rachel had mentioned, called nested freedom. And we're going to do this all in about 39 minutes from here. So here I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to recommend four books for you that relate to the themes that I just mentioned. And there are a number more that I could direct you to. In fact, some of these I feel like this list of books I could recommend keeps getting longer and longer because there's so much good work these days on, on risk and perceptions. But for the purpose of today's session, I want you to read four. So the first one is a book by Eric Beinhacker called The Origin of Wealth. He's at Oxford University and he does an outstanding job in this book of introducing readers to complexity economics and complex, mostly adaptive systems. If you read his book, you'll never see the world in the same way. It's a mind shifting dive into how things around us intersect in systems that create things that are valuable and sometimes destroy them too. Now it's more than 15 years since this book was published, but it remains a strong selling book. And if you've only taken an introductory economics course, or even if you've earned a graduate degree in economics, your understanding of that subject will be changed forever by this book. You will never, quote, assume an economy again, but that's just the beginning. Now, the graphic you see on the screen right now is not from Beinhacker's book, but I use these to illustrate the idea of complex systems where agents, any part of a system, a person's an agent, a computer's an agent, um, resources are agents, where any part of, uh, in a complex system where agents interact with each other. So as a side note, I referenced Beinhacker's book and some of the work of his colleagues at a place called the Santa Fe Institute, which is the home of complexity Bein science, Institute. in the early the parts of my first book. Science. And I want to give proper credit for that because when I was putting this book together, there was one gap in it. There was one thing missing in pulling together all sorts of things that I had learned both in my schooling and in my time in work. And it was when I finally read about complexity economics that that brought all this together. So I wanna give proper credit to that group and some amazing work they're doing. And my guess is most people on the call have never heard of the Santa Fe Institute, but I'm gonna direct you out there because again, you, you will never see things the same way once you become familiar with the work that do, they're doing. So back to the image on the screen. This is a really simple relationship between three agents or the three parties that are shown in this screen. The lines connecting them are avenues of communication. 
and the thickness of the lines indicates the strength of their relationship. It's a visual proxy for how much trust there is between two parties. In this example, we can see that the relationship agent A has with agent B is stronger, has a thicker line, than the relationship it has with agent C. And agent B and agent C have no relationship except through agent A. So when agent A is trying to make a decision, if agent B and agent C provide conflicting guidance, conflicting advice, agent A will be more influenced by the advice from agent B. This is a simple representation of trust and its impact on how we make decisions. But in reality, relations, relationships are far more complex. People we know also know others who also through various iterations may know or have heard of us. How many times have you heard the expression, it's such a small world when you realize you and another person know someone in common? Getting back to Rachel and I discovering some of our family uh, overlap in, in her birth town. These passive communication and relative levels of trust can also impact us. As you can see from the graphic here, the flow of data, the flow of communication may be through multiple paths before we are even aware of it, if we ever are. And why do these networks matter? Because each intersection, each path of communication here is an opportunity for value to be created or destroyed. And the breadth, stability, and complexity of these networks can greatly enhance value or rapidly destroy it. Oftentimes because of something we've done, but sometimes, and maybe even more often, because of something outside of our control, but that happens within our network. Now let's look at a more famous network from the game Six Degrees of Separation from Kevin Bacon. And Rachel's heard me say this before. I know that this game makes me old. This goes back a ways. But at least when I was younger, this was a popular game. And the goal was to name a Hollywood star and in less than six steps, connect them back to the actor Kevin Bacon. The graphic you see represents an incredibly small part of Kevin Bacon's network. If viewed in full, it's actually no surprise that with even modest Hollywood knowledge, winning the six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon game is not that difficult. But what I want you to see in this graphic is not the celebrity. I want you to see that the flow of information around him, even in the small subset of his network, is extraordinary and most times does not flow through him. In other words, he's only going to be aware of an incredibly small, nearly zero, percentage of what people are saying about him and what they say about him impacts his value as an actor, not to mention potentially his self-esteem. Now I want you to replace Kevin Bacon in the middle of this graphic with the company or organization where you're associated. The idea is exactly the same. Your value is determined by other people and you will not know what most say about you, but what they say about you matters greatly for your ability to create value. So quickly in summary about our complex social networks, they are first and foremost much bigger and more complex than most of us consider. Second, they have important impacts on our ability to do things, our capacity to do things, because our networks will go a long way towards determining our influence and often our value as an organization. Now to some of what I've learned from the neuroscientists and psychologists and two more books I want to recommend to you. They're, they're both relatively new. The second of the four books today that I'm recommending to you is one called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain by Lisa Feldman Barrett. Really compressed book, under, I think it's under 100 pages, um, but in, and incredibly accessible. But I'm just going to highlight one of the things that you'll learn from this book. But it's a really important one both for her argument and our conversation today. In short, she says our brain exists to do only two things, find energy and decide when to spend it. Remember this, remember that, that relationship. It's crucial for thinking about how boards and in fact, all groups or organizations like our companies work. The third recommended book is called Deviate by Bo Lotto, also at Oxford University. Again, for brevity, I'm gonna choose one key element of that book and strongly suggest you read the whole thing. And I'll warn you about Bo Lotto's book in the same way that I warned you about Eric Beinhacker's book. If you read Bo Lotto's book, the way in which you see things is going to be changed forever, not always comfortably. 
because Bolado's book will give you some discomfort in in believing what you're actually seeing. Still, incredibly value valuable stuff to know. So in his book, there's a discussion of where our biases come from. And it talks about how the brain focuses on making quick decisions by finding the nearest memory to the source of stimulation to assess the best response. This, at least according to the one brain in which that action is happening, is the most efficient, spends the least energy, in other words, way to choose an action to take. So two really important looks at what our brain does, how it came to exist and how it works. And I, I strongly recommend both of those books to you if you have an interest in, in this area of understanding risk. There's a lot more in each of them. So the fourth book I'm going to recommend to you is by Bart Madden, and it's called Value Creation Principles. Bart and I had just sort of an arbitrary introduction to each other a few years back. Um, I was invited over to his house for a meeting and, and thought it would just be one of these introductory meetings. And Bart had a copy of my first book in front of him with a lot of post-it notes sticking out of it. I didn't know how this conversation was going to go. I thought he might be uh, there to tell me about how wrong I was. But it turned out Bart and I had a lot of alignment in what we were thinking. And he was in the process of finishing this book called Value Creation Principles. So Bart and I have been in contact quite a bit since then. But he focuses on something called a knowledge building loop in this. He also redefines risk in this book, and we might talk about that a little bit later. But a knowledge building loop that drives innovation and value creation at companies. His is also a systems based approach, getting back again to the Beinhacker work, to thinking. In short, how information flows through an organization or even a single person is a continuous process. And the perceptions that drive action are created in our minds based on past experiences and the worldview from which we begin. This ties very nicely into Bo Lotto's work. In order for organizations to continue to create value, having diverse experiences and worldviews engaged in the knowledge building process is essential. This isn't just something you hear people talking about who have a more social conscious. There is building evidence in neuroscience that diversity in the room is valuable. It leads to better decision making and better responses to things you didn't expect. So don't think anymore that this is just some sort of soft idea. There's some hard science behind this now. So I keep mentioning this word value without really talking about what it is. It's a bit like when economists talk about an economy and assuming that one exists, but never finding it necessary to explain how it forms in the first place. That's one of the great things of Beinhacker's book is you will learn how an economy forms. But I'm going to take a shortcut here again because I find it necessary to explain. <laughs> excuse me, I'm finding it that I want to want to truncate this part of the conversation to fit into the time that we've got here because we could go very deep into this idea of, quote, a value equation. So value can be described in this way. How much of something you have already that someone else would find worth exchanging for something they have? This gets back to that whole idea of barter economies and how they started. Value creation is something that happens when a decision you make to exchange that something you have provides you with something more than you started with. It's as simple as exchanging money for a cup of coffee in the morning that makes you more productive or allocating tens of millions of dollars of capital, <clears throat> excuse me, tens of million dollars of capital that will lead to long term investment returns in excess of the cost of that capital. It's what comes from choosing friends, choosing where you live, who you'll talk to, who you work with. It comes from finding more energy from the choices you make to expend energy in search of that find. It's something your brain is trying to do all the time. So I use a very simple illustration, call it an equation, the value equation, to show how that brain of yours is trying to do the math to determine if value is being created when you think about spending energy. Three components to this equation, the part on the top, the U's, the UIs, are the things that give you utility if you're somebody who's, uh, who's uh, studied economics, or you can think of it as something you find useful is another way to, to map it to the letter U. The numerical subscripts that you see indicate that you expect to receive these things at various points of time in the future. So it's some sort of an extended benefit that you're getting in most cases. 
The ellipsis at the end of the equation suggests that the stream continues out for some amount of time. You know, there are easy ways in some cases to define that amount of time, but this here is an illustration. Just it goes on for some amount of time, which may be for a long time or only for a few periods. And finally, in the denominator is something that reflects the chance that our expectations around the U's and around the length of time we're going to receive those U's are not met. These are called discount rates. Anybody who's done valuation on fixed income securities is probably familiar with this idea of a discount rate. But those also have numerical indicators to them, indicating that discount rates are not the same in each period of time. And that's something that's really important, something that's really not done well in a lot of finance textbooks. In short, when we're determining the value of something, you're asking three questions, or your brain is asking three questions about what you expect from the energy you expend to get it. One, how much of something I like will I get in return? Two, how many times or for how long, for how long will I get it? What's the chance that I'll be disappointed? So as might seem obvious to you, since you guys are all pretty good at math, if the amount that you expect to receive goes up, the value goes up. If the length of time or the number of times you expect to receive something goes up, the value goes up. If the chance that you'll be disappointed goes down, the value goes up. I often say this to people, governance of our organizations is about making those three things happen, ideally simultaneously. It's easy, right? Simple equation. Well, as I've mentioned, if you've done fixed income analysis, you're probably familiar with this. So if you're if you're modeling the value of a G7 treasury bond, for example, it's pretty simple. We know what the payment schedule is. We know the amount of each payment, and it's pretty much 100% certain that you'll get to everything you expect in return. If you're measuring something with uncertainty, however, outcomes become much more complex. Again, you keep hearing me this word. Yes, complex, not complicated, complex, and that's a big difference. My introduction to this came when I was running risk for a mortgage company, and we started to look at human behavior around prepayments. If any of you have modeled the risk on mortgage securities, they are really fun. They're really fun to model, but you know, as we know from the financial crisis, they can also create some, some issues. But mortgage bonds have uncertain futures to them, uncertain payments in the future. So they're, they're really interesting and really difficult sometimes to value. But if you remember what I said about boards and what they're most concerned about now, they've also got some serious uncertainty about what the future brings. You remember the Kevin Bacon network that I talked about and we put your organization at the middle of it. <clears throat> there is also some serious complexity that's being brought into this system um, that is our organization. So the jobs of boards today, or I should say the jobs of boards under normal times are far more difficult than a lot of people appreciate. But today, the job of a board member or boards collectively is extremely difficult. And that means in our roles, particularly those who are working inside of boards or supporting boards or reporting to boards, it's really important we understand how to help them make better decisions. So let me bring four ideas together here from this part of the presentation. First, value is created or destroyed through the complex interaction of agents in systems who each decide when and on what to expend their energy. Two, people and organizations need energy in order to continue living. We need to find it and decide how to use it as our primary actions. Three, our decisions about spending energy are going to be influenced by our set of memories, and our experiences, also called information, that are already in our brains. These are individual brains, as well as the collective brain of a system like an organization. We can get really deep into a conversation about why you could also view an organization as an individual with a brain, but that's another presentation. So the fourth thing is sharing knowledge or this information we talked about in a loop can change how our individual and collective brains become better at making decisions and how and when to spend energy and how and where to find it. So I want to talk about risk now in a slightly different context, and that's considering risk perceptions and considering them as an emotion, a feeling. The work of Daniel Kahneman and Avis Tversky, many of you may be very familiar with their work, 
One of them won a Nobel Prize for it. The other would have, except their rules about being alive when the prize is awarded. So Amos Tversky did not get the Nobel Prize. In a classic example, what they refer to as this thing called prospect theory, framing a choice, in this case given to the director of public health in a town regarding a virus that is lethal and affecting the community, it affects the choice that somebody selects. So in these two examples, and I'm gonna show you a second one here, the outcome is exactly the same from an expected value standpoint. But in this, pic in this particular choice, 70% of people choose the first option in, as it's presented to them like this. In the second framing of the same question, 80% switch to option two. These are the same expected outcomes. The only difference is that one is framed in the context of loss and the other is framed in the context of gain. Framing is really important. It impacts the decision-making of all individuals and groups, including boards of directors. But even more critical is the way in which the magnitude of potential loss is perceived. One really important consideration for those governing risk taking, and this includes managing risk, is how likely it is that a negative risk event will become amplified. Examples of amplification include the financial crisis in 2008, where hundreds of billions of dollars in losses on subprime mortgages became trillions of dollars of losses around the world, including in many sectors with little or no connection to the subprime market. A stampede out of a crowded theater when someone yells fire is another, and the way in which people responded to the pandemic when it appeared to be out of control is a third example. The concept of social amplification, which is what how this is referred to, was examined by two psychologists, Paul Slovic and Elke Weber, and in their insightful work, they in excuse me identified characteristics of realized risks along two dimensions. The first, dread which is the potential for a highly significant negative impact on an individual or a group. And the second dimension is knowledge, or more accurately, a lack of knowledge or risk of what they call the unknown. What they learned in the research is that a negative risk, in order for it to amplify, it must score high on both dread and risk of the unknown. The latter can be a lack of knowledge by the person being impacted, but it's often a lack of knowledge by experts. And you're all in expert roles. So this is a really important thing for you to remember. In other words, we have to have the sense that if experts don't know what they're doing, and I'll give you one example, when our president over here suggested to his medical advisors that we inject some kind of disinfectant into people to combat the pandemic, the risk of amplification of negative impact increases greatly. So the image on the screen here is an adaptation of one that Slovak and Weber had in their paper and I include, this, include the subprime crisis on here. You also th see things on here about microwaves. So that gives you a sense that this paper is actually uh, a bit uh, dated, maybe 20 years ago or so, I think it came out. And I also include on here three stages of the pandemic. At the start, the pandemic was high in dread, but there was some trust in experts until it seemed they too were conflicted in what to do. And as I mentioned, things that our president was saying. So the pandemic moved into an area where negative applications, things like a 97% drop in air travel happened. Once vaccines emerged, which were developed by experts and guidance became more aligned, the pandemic moved to a new place on this grid and life mostly has returned to normal except for those who've been impacted by personal loss. This is a really helpful way for us to be thinking about risks that could go places that we hadn't expected. So if negative risk amplification might affect or is currently affecting you or your organization, you'd rightly ask, how can we interrupt it? How can we stop amplification? Turns out we only need to address one of the two dimensions to stop the accelerated impact. Usually this is accomplished by increasing knowledge or the faith people have in you as experts or experts generally. So if you remember back to Bart Madden's knowledge building loop, it's another way in which organizations can stop internal negative amplification by always bringing in new knowledge into the decision-making process, especially at the board and executive level. So in some here, fear of the unknown, 
especially with high levels of dread, increases the likelihood that risk will amplify, meaning the impact on the denominator in the value equation can be enormous. And we know it's also going to bias our consideration of taking risk. Boards are dealing with lots of unknowns, and the recent pandemic experience is a very has injected the sense of dread. It's a very near memory in our brains. So our individual and corporate brains right now will use that memory more often than they should. A similar example of this is to think of stepping out into a street and almost being hit by a bus that you didn't see. The next time you step into the street, you're going to look very carefully to see if another bus is coming. Your brain wants you to continue living, but each time you hesitate, you've been delayed. And each time a business hesitates to take risk and because of some fear, its value might be impaired by that opportunity that's lost. And the caution and fear you have cause your brain to burn more energy because it's on high alert. The human body is a complex system. It needs energy to live. It needs to keep finding energy. Every organization is a complex system. Organizations need energy to live. They need to keep finding energy. The form of energy at organizations is what we call capital. Capital comes in many forms, the most commonly discussed being uh, financial capital, and it's often overemphasized in business schools. But if you look at this next graphic, this is what I call an organization's social network. You can see that those that are featured on this particular chart are groups that are all energy providers. They're all capital providers to us, all members of our complex system that from which we hope to be able to create value in our ideas. We get their capital in some amount and for some cost. Now I'm going to make a slightly abrupt transition to discuss the concept of freedom. You might think I'm going to start waving my American flag, but that's not the case. Freedom is a word that we use a lot over here, but I often think it's misunderstood, as is another word, liberty, which I'll talk about in just a second. But are you aware that there are different forms of freedom? Not everyone uses the name or the term freedom in the same way, and the terms I introduce here might be a little bit different, uh, interpreted a little bit differently by some. But the expression positive freedom is generally used to describe your capacities. These can be financial capacities, intellectual, physical, uh, political, and more. It's a measure of your ability to do things if you have no restrictions on your behavior. Not all of us have the same amount of positive freedom. Some have very little. Some have exorbitant amounts. And if you're asking how big is your positive freedom, well, it depends on how much capital you can attract, how much energy you can get, excuse me, relative to the cost of attaining that capital or the energy you spend. Think of your education, your resume, your friend and business connections, your physical strength, your health, your appearance, your bank balance. All of these have an influence on the degree to which you have positive freedom. Organizations have to attract capital in financial forms, but they also have to attract intellectual capital, human capital, customers for working capital, and even something called freedom capital which is the legal structure that allows them to operate in pursuit of some goals with the protection of things like property rights. An organization's positive freedom is based on these, but the value of the organization is not just the sum of its capital. It's a bit of magic from complexity science that we'll touch on later. Negative freedom, the other definition you see on your screen is the second kind I'll mention here. It's any form of restriction on your ability to fully utilize your positive freedom. So think about simple things like a stop sign or a disapproving glance, your religious or moral beliefs, your work policies, laws and regulations, even the store, even the hours that a store is open. These are all restrictions on your ability to exercise your positive freedom. And you can see how these negative freedoms begin to add up and might become annoying, especially if you have lots of positive freedom that you'd like to use. Negative freedom is important though because it's about maintaining liberty. I'll gloss over this here again, because this, this conversation about freedom and liberty can go to a lot of different places. And not everyone's gonna agree with me on this notion of what liberty is. But to me, the word liberty is that which ensures the laws and regulations imposed by the state are fairly applied to all. 
It's the trust we have in government, including the courts, to fairly apply and guarantee property rights, among other rights, regardless of the degree to which someone has positive freedom. Somewhat paradoxically, the degree to which we have liberty will ultimately determine how much of the positive freedom those with lots of it will actually keep. Still, it's not generally appreciated by people in that group, especially if they want something right now. Think of it this way. Liberty is a condition of the collective, but to be enjoyed by the individual. Liberty is our protection from the exercise of other people's positive freedom, their capacities to act, where that exercise impacts us in some harmful way. So back to business. How do organizations attract all the forms of capital that they need? So go back again to the value equation. Remember what your brain is trying to do and what the capital provider's brain is trying to do to assess whether to exchange their energy with you. And we're gonna look at the capital attraction cycle here. At the start of any organization, you have an idea. That's the first bit of capital that's present in the formation of an organization or business or any collaboration. It could be a party that you plan to have designed to realize the purpose of an idea. To succeed though, we're typically gonna to need to attract more capital, intellectual, financial. How good is our story? This is the process for attracting the capital. We of course have to have a good enough story for those capital providers to think they'll gain from our relationship with us. And once we have that capital, it's the organization's job to put it to work in pursuit of its purpose, to take risk. Businesses exist to take risk. The result of this effort gives capital providers their first feedback, their first data point regarding whether their initial expectations, those U's that we had talked about in the value equation, were accurate or if they've been disappointed or if they meet with a positive surprise. If we're doing well, our positive freedom is growing because of this and we'll likely seek to continue the relationship with these capital providers. Now at this point, the capital providers are again assessing forward the likelihood of being disappointed and what they expect to get in, in exchange for their relationship with us. There's been some input from the feedback they just received, and this forward look is the denominator again of that value equation. At this point in the cycle, we're saying that the cost of attracting capital that creates this additional positive freedom is highly dependent on what neuroscientists would call feed forward. It's a feed forward assessment of the likelihood those providing the capital are going to be disappointed. This is different from feedback. This is our brain making predictions about finding energy. Again, getting to that very basic function of our brains. If we find energy and use it well, we create more positive freedom. We create value. Now, remember earlier when I said, if you're measuring uncertainty, the valuation process is complex. Complex is an important word in contrast to simply complicated. And I wanna look now at a graphical representation of both this positive and negative freedom concepts or these concepts. Let's use the large circle, large circle you see on your screen right now as our starting point. This represents the amount of our positive freedom. Absent any restrictions, you can use all of it. Nothing is encroaching on us. Now let's consider what people we work, uh, excuse me, people we work with and people we know. These groups have expectations of us in terms of what, in terms of what we will do. There are things our positive freedom would allow us to do that they would not consider to be appropriate. Let's overlay their expectations on our positive freedom here. Some of their expectations do not include these things we are capable of doing given our positive freedom. So by associating with them, we've lost a little bit of our positive freedom. Now let's consider laws and regulations. Thankfully, our friends in our work have similar restrictions to the law, although they're not identical. So when we're subject to laws and regulations, we lose a little bit more of our positive freedom. Now let's overlay our neighbors, our church, religion, faith, local laws, national laws, et cetera. You get the picture, literally, you get the picture right here. Each one of these entities potentially takes away a little bit of our positive freedom because they're not identical to each other. They have different interests, different values, different perspectives. What remains is an overlap of their rules and expectations is a kind of nest in which we're able to do anything we want 
without offending any of these other parts of our network. This is our nested freedom. This is where this concept of nested freedom comes from. Now we can illustrate the same thing for our organizations. The restrictions our organizations face come from each group of capital providers. Our organizations also have a degree of nested freedom, which is almost always a subset of our positive freedom. So what? You may be asking that right now. Well, here's where complexity, the value equation and risk come into play. When we fail one of our capital providers or someone in our personal network, their restrictions on us grow. More accurately, the freedom they will tolerate shrinks. Or if the case is that they start to want more from us in exchange for keeping the same set of restrictions, in other words, charging more for their capital, which is the energy we need, our positive freedom will shrink. Now, since all the members of our network are likely to have some connection to each other, this gets back to that notion of the complex networks within we, which we operate. A failure of one of them cascades to cause others or maybe all of them to reduce the degree to which they trust us, reducing both our nested and our positive freedom. It's even possible that our nested freedom disappears if that disappointment is so egregious. In other words, the sum effect is we're no longer allowed to operate. But the opposite is equally true. The trust we earn from people in our network can allow their nests of control to expand. There's a gentleman in Canada named Alex Todd who defined the word trust as both acceptable uncertainty, where we're comfortable with the expected future in terms of our relationships, and also, and importantly, the willingness to increase our vulnerability. The latter points to the ability <clears throat> to attract more capital, which we talked about in that cycle, more energy, thereby expanding our nests, which is essential for us to utilize any increases that we realize in our positive freedom through our successful efforts. Now I want to get to the role of the board here and, and we'll we'll just we'll finish up fairly soon. Value creation requires a continuous process of finding more energy. And that's something we've already mentioned mentioned. Establishing the environment wherein that can happen is the purview of the board of directors of an organization. In my world, I consider corporate governance to be the process of establishing an environment and ensuring that it continues. It's the way in which an organization lives. Again, getting this notion that an organization can also be thought of as a living entity. Boards have three primary tasks. The first is to establish the strategic objectives for the organization. Typically, they look out one, three, five years, or even longer periods of time. When fixed income, uh, or excuse me, when they're when they're making uh, large fixed uh, capital investments in particular. The second is to hire, evaluate, and plan for the succession of someone to lead that effort, which is typically the chief executive officer. And the third is that they have to provide oversight of the chief executive to ensure that the organization is operating within whatever restrictions they or the nest within the organization operates have established. So these three things constitute what is called the duty of care, what's generally known as the duty of care. Now, care is becoming difficult. You, you heard me mention earlier just how difficult the job of boards of directors is, is in this current environment. It's hard under normal conditions, particularly hard in this. <clears throat> The complex intersection of these networks, the volatility of our nests, make the, make the challenge of seeing into the future and assessing both probabilities, point estimates, and distributions of possible outcomes incredibly difficult. And as I mentioned before, strategic planning at the board level requires that board members look into the future as a fundamental duty. So let me focus on two sources of dynamism in this environment. The first is generational. Any organization that does not recognize the difference in how information is communicated through these networks by younger generations is highly vulnerable. And Kevin Bacon starred in Footloose. If people didn't like the movie, they could maybe tell their friends, write a review in the paper. There wasn't anything they could do online. Word would travel, but it would travel very slowly, meaning that Kevin Bacon's agent or the movie studio could get out in front of that and redefine perceptions. Today, even the definition of speaking doesn't have the same meaning as it did to people my age. It doesn't mean that two people are actually in the same place. It could include sharing Instagram posts, TikToks, memes, or just even texting with each other. They'll refer to as speaking to each other. What we know in younger generations is that on average, their networks extend much farther than the generation to which I belong. Those relationships also share information in nanoseconds, as you know through the experience of people like J.K. Rowling and Dave Chappelle, who saw how quickly their reputations could be damaged by something they said. 
Another example is how corporations responded to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Immediately, they announced their withdrawal of brands and more from Russia. And this wasn't because they had regulations they were facing. Those came later. Rather, what they recognized is that their nests of freedom could be impacted globally if they did not because of the values of others. So if you consider this overall geopolitical environment and the challenge that our organizations face, New coalitions right now are being formed based on the response to the Russian invasion, the response that NATO had to that. Others are being formed around religious alignments or resource concentrations. But more subtle are those that are being formed in a forward-looking realm of technology and economic position. The choice that a company makes today, for example, regarding 5G standards could have decades-long implications for the size of their nested freedom. Do you choose the Chinese standard and risk outright ban among US customers? Or do you choose the US standard and risk that your Asia operations are damaged should China emerge as the global economic or regional powerhouse for the next 50, 100, 200 years? Here's where this all comes together with a large impact on the success of our organizations. Again, this is one of the most important areas of understanding that's needed and it's greatly underappreciated. How does the perception of risk impact your board's ability to work effectively? Trust has to be present among board members too. The board is a complex adaptive system, albeit a smaller one than most. The ability of agents in this network to work together effectively depends on the trust they have in each other and in the chief executive they empower, getting back to the primary duties. What builds trust in such a small group and, is, and dynamic times? <clears throat> Every board member has a risk personality. Rachel had mentioned this group that uh, we had spoken to uh, a few weeks back. They're focused on identifying these risk personalities and every board's risk personality is a result of the complex interaction of these individual risk personalities. The personalities can become evident under stress. And if you remember how I started this session and what I just talked about again, boards are facing a tremendous amount of stress. There's so much that's in motion. So what we know is that stress and fear are impacting board decision-making right now. And one big challenge is that most boards don't know this. They don't know their risk personalities unless they've been forward-looking in asking about them. So what do we do about these challenging issues? The cynical approach is to find out what people in our complex network wanna hear, tell them what they want. You hear of greenwashing, sports washing, um, commonly uh, talked about today for organizations that want to look better than they really are. But the sustainable approach is to be transparent, to know your risk taking well, and then allow the sorting of those collectively determining our nested freedom to happen naturally. It's about using an empowering governance system that distributes responsibility for taking and managing risks that integrates capital providers. And I want to make sure we understand this, Stakeholders are capital providers. It's another word for the same thing. So don't confuse stakeholders as some, again, outside idea that people with, with what in the States they would call more liberal values um, have. Stakeholders are simply capital providers. We want to involve them in the process of our governance. And there are Nobel winning ideas for how to do that. This is all about creating a positive feed forward emotional response in those who provide us with capital and maintaining the trust to do it continuously. We often focus only on the gains from our work and we don't often focus on how we reduce the cost of capital, which comes through trust. We know that fear causes us to shorten horizons. We know fear combined with a lack of knowledge leads to an increasing risk of negative amplifications. We know our brains are gonna seek quick answers and go to the nearest memory to decide how to act when threatened. We know we must take risks to thrive, let alone survive. And we know that adding a diverse set of memories to the collective brain of an organization makes it more likely we will not miss out on opportunities to act. So how does an intelligent board understand its collective brain's attitude towards risk? Well, beginning with an understanding of the small network that sits in the boardroom together, especially developing further emotional intelligence around risk and around risk personalities, and then aligning those with the duties of board committees. 
This leads to a greater level of trust in the boardroom and getting to the work that you guys are doing, that trust is gonna be enhanced even further when you use more modern accounting approaches that focus on sustainability, scenario analysis, predictive modeling, and ultimately getting to this place of incorporating risk as a line item cost. I can go back about 18, 20 years when I shared the stage with the uh, Chris Matten, who at that time was the controller of Swiss Bank Group, and he said, risk is the single biggest item that does not appear on an income statement. And he was right back then, but we can't let that continue to be right. This is somewhere where you guys can have a tremendous influence on how organizations make better decision making. So wrapping up here, it's often said about many things that boards of directors do, an approach like this will cascade through the organization. This is gonna allow for greater value creation, greater resiliency, better decision-making throughout the organization. Nothing guarantees that all decisions are going to be good ones, but it doesn't mean they need to be. They don't have to be. The truth is, when we know how to respond to things we did not expect, when something doesn't go well, and when our decisions are wrong, that's gonna enhance the trust that the capital providers have in us too, not just generating returns, but how do we truncate the loss side of what we're doing? This makes it easier for our collective brain as an organization to find energy and decide when to expend it. And we do this all within the nests in which we operate. If we do, we're gonna enjoy more freedom and we have the opportunity to create more value. So the very last thing is to do is just to remind you of the four things I hope you pulled out of this presentation today and we can talk some more about them here in the time that we have left. But understand your organizations are complex systems that have high dependencies on other systems. Recognize that these are almost inescapable Know that we can create value better when we incorporate the knowledge from these dependencies. And finally, and probably most importantly, come to know that trust is the central element to all value creation decision making that we do. And there is a role for accounting and risk management to play in enhancing that trust, which I think we're going to continue to see grow even as my career in this space ends. 